Honestly, a lot of students in America today, a lot of people are frankly downright uncomfortable having a conversation with someone they've never met. I don't find it terribly comfortable still, and I've been doing it for years. But you need to learn that. And so it's a practical way to learn that kind of basic advocacy because at a certain point, as we grow up, we're gonna find ourselves in a place where we have to go up and advocate for ourselves, for our family, for our children, and you need the confidence to be able to do that. Welcome to Homeschool Talks, a podcast by HSLDA. This is a show about all things homeschooling, from practical tips to inspiring stories and everything in between. You can find show notes for this episode along with our other Homeschool Talks conversations at hslda.org forward slash podcast. And if you want to be the first to know about new episodes, as well as upcoming guests and topics, sign up for our email list using the link in the show notes. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we hope you enjoyed the program. Here's your host, Jim Mason. Hi, I'm Jim Mason, president of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and uh, welcome to another version of Homeschool Talks. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about what HSLDA does, you can go to our website at hslda.org. Our mission is to make homeschooling possible by advancing and protecting the boundaries of homeschool freedom. Today, my guest is Joel Gruy. He's the executive director of our sister organization, HSLDA Action, and he's been a longtime leader in our program called Generation Joshua. Very uh, excited to talk to him today, but I want to warn you, you have to listen fast when you're listening to Joel because he talks really fast. So put on your fast listening ears. Welcome, Joel. Thank you, Jim. I tried to be good today. I, I limited myself to one cup of coffee, recognizing this was on my schedule this afternoon. We'll see. <laughs> so, Joel, I've known you for a long time, um, yeah. and we're going to talk about your role here at HSLDA and okay. HSLDA Action and a little bit about your personal background, your family life. How long have you worked at the various HSLDA uh, institutions? I think I came on as a... It was an intern or like a student worker in 2007. I got interviewed for, by a guy from HSLDA that I'd never heard of before while I was driving the DC Beltway in a stick shift for my very first time. It was not the greatest interview. I didn't even know um, who I was talking to, but it, it worked out pretty well. So, And, yeah. and when did you and uh, Christy get married? So we got married back in 2004. Um, in Spokane, Washington, and then we moved out here about three years after that in 2007. And your first child was born when? December of 2009. So I think I knew you <coughs> before you had any children, and now you have three rather rambunctious, uh, charming young men for uh, for your children. Tell us about them. Rambunctious is absolutely accurate. Charming depends on whether they want something or not. Well, charming, charming. I can <laughs> say they're charming because yeah. I don't have to deal with them. <laughs> that's true. That's true. You know, I have three boys now. The oldest is just entering uh, seventh grade this year. Um, the youngest is seven years old. So it kind of goes from uh, 12 uh, for a little bit longer uh, down to seven. So tell us what you do um, here for HSLDA. So as you mentioned earlier, I'm the executive director of HSLDA Action. Now Action as the sister organization to HSLDA is basically where we house our federal policy, um, our lobbying initiatives, our political action work, and then Generation Joshua that you mentioned earlier. Gen J is not quite as automatically intuitive as federal policy or lobbying. Um, what it is is a organization or a, a unit within HSLDA's kind of larger area that is designed to educate high school students, um, teenagers in general, about how their government works, how they can be involved in it, why it works the way it does, how to be effective in, in that arena, how to take the ideas they believe and advocate for them well. So it kind of is this intersection of um, education. Uh, we, do, we definitely do some ministry work within it, and then also some political engagement all at the same time. So tell us about the camps you do. You guys just finished your uh, summer camps. How long have you been doing camps and what are those all about? So camps were starting shortly before I got here, but we kind of rebuilt them back in the summer of 2008 to something that we call iGovern. And the idea behind it is what does government look like? And we put you in the role of that government. So we do two different camps, 
One of them is I govern classic and one of them is I govern statecraft. Uh, the classic camp is domestic policy and politics in America. So a student would come in and they would take the role of a congressman or a senator. Uh, they might be a member of the press. That's always interesting. Or maybe part of the White House, uh, the administration. And we look at domestic policy, how laws are made, budget, accounting. They even have to file taxes and mess with the IRS. And they do the campaign work and the fundraising and the lobbying, on how laws are made how bills are passed, and even the election process. That's domestic. That's the first week. The second week... Wait, wait, wait. Before you sorry. go any further. Yeah. Um, so as I understand it, you gather a bunch of kids and you mm -hmm. sit them down in chairs at tables and you lecture to them about <laughs> government all day long. Is that is that right? Not so much. No, the idea is that the students become... Uh, what they're learning rather than be a lecture. I, I, I grew up going to homeschool conferences. I was homeschooled myself. Um, I made this horrifically ironic vow at one point walking out of my ninth teen program or whatever it was at that point I said Lord if for any reason you ever put me in charge of teen programs I will never ever make it a lecture system and the Lord has a sense of humor of course and now I'm doing that sort of thing and so we we, we follow that we the students um, act in it so the, the lectures if we have them and we do have a few but I don't think any of them clear more than about 45 minutes maybe an hour at most and the idea is that the students take on the role. So it's not that you learn about being a senator, you are the senator. So you are actually making motions and passing legislation and negotiating deals and editing the documents. Or maybe you're writing, uh, you're getting a scoop on a story and writing an op-ed or uh, something of that, that nature. And so you learn the principles because you're having to actually apply them in real life. And I find that to be a far more effective method of learning. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. And your staff, um, they've been with you a long time, most of them. And they have. Uh, they love this stuff. Tell us a little about your staff. Yeah, so I have a, a kind of a small team in the office, about six or seven people that that act as experts in different areas of government. So we have Glenn, who's kind of the parliamentary nerd. He, he knows everything about legislative process that I never knew. And uh, you know he's good when when high-end academic institutions will call him up to ask for information because they their experts didn't know. And we have Jeremiah, who was actually in our federal lobbying department at HSLDA uh, for a long time and now acts as my deputy director, but kind of produces all of the camp and the simulations and the narratives. And he works in our political operations as well. He's the director of our PACs. And then we have a handful of other people that range from like student counseling work um, and mentoring programs uh, to the stuff we do on stage to kind of our speaker team. There's a whole, a whole cadre of people with different expertise areas and we bring those in and, and let the kids kind of try it rather than just hearing about it. Because frankly, as much as I love reading a book at a certain point, you want to actually see what it feels like. And you don't really understand how hard it is to adhere to some of these principles we believe until you're kind of in the pressure cooker. And so we build that and you get to test out how well you, you survive and how well you work in there in a place that's not real. So if you actually screw it up, no one actually gets hurt. Um, but it's a great way to learn that way. So my youngest daughter, who just started college this year, attended a camp a few years ago where I think they accidentally blew up North Korea. They did. I remember that camp. <laughs> it wasn't quite North Korea. What they did is they had a... Then that, that was actually our week two. We call it statecraft. They were trying to deal with to stop a North Korean incursion of South Korea. And the plan that was concocted by a handful of sophomores and juniors in high school was to physically separate North and South Korea via kinetic force. It was not the best plan I've seen. It was also not the worst, which is telling you something, but it's a chance to try things out, right? Um, they learned a few things about that. Uh, and, but you know what? That, they got to see what happened. And then, and then the simulation, as in real life, reacted to that. And they had to deal with the consequences of a maybe less than well thought through plan just like in real life and kind of like understanding the costs of your actions and the kind of the, the, the repercussions of decisions. Well, that's a real part of life. And I think sometimes we learn things in the abstract and haven't thought through that most things have a cost or a consequence or um, something that you have to pay to be able to do it. And so we build that in the simulation as a way to learn. And sometimes you're laughing, but it doesn't mean it's made it any easier. Mm. So tell us a little bit more about statecraft. I think I interrupted you before. Oh, you, well, we led right into it. Statecraft is the foreign policy side of it. So it's national security and you're looking at international relations and it's comparative government. So some of the students come in as um, ambassadors from other countries in the United Nations. So we have a, a very robust United Nations program. It's actually, I'd argue, a little more robust than the model UN program you see running around. Um, apparently, 
Uh, we have this habit of trusting teenagers to actually act as adults, at least until they prove they can't. And there's limits, of course. But uh, they represent 30, 40, 50 different countries um, and the diplomatic uh, and strategic goals of those countries. And at the same time, we have the U.S. executive branch, or at least parts of it, the National Security Council. We have a series of the intelligence agencies, the Department of Defense, the Department of Justice, the Department of State, um, and then usually a couple others that vary year by year depending on the simulation. And then, of course, the White House staff. And they're trying to navigate and wrestle with and and respond to crises that are happening, sometimes connected crises where it's actually part of a larger narrative. Sometimes it's just the stuff that flares up every day. And you're like, I don't know what to do with this diplomatic question, but you got to think it through. And you got to say, what are the principles I believe and how do they apply here? Um, does this matter? Does it not? Am I spending time or, or resources in a way that's useful or not? And then you have kind of the the layers of government that work your way from the, the top down, because some stuff is never going to get to the president's desk. It's going to be handled by the undersecretary for Middle Eastern Affairs for Jordan, right? But that person there also has principles that has to be applied. And, and sometimes you have to realize this is over my pay grade. I need to bump it up. And sometimes you're like, well, I guess I make the call. And then you make the call and then we see whether it was a good call or not. Uh, and it, it's a great way to learn. Same thing. And then we teach ethics and we teach um, a kind of how how our, our moral compass and like understanding what our principles are apply in this area because national security without any sort of moral constraints or guidelines is really dangerous. So we, we talk through what it looks like to have principles applied there, the difference between you as a person and maybe you acting on behalf of a government, uh, what that looks like, kind of wrestle through the, the, the moral and theological components of that and, and let people try stuff out and say, what would happen if we did this? And sometimes the answer is, oh, that's actually a pretty clever idea. We had we had one guy who had a really good idea on how to try and settle the India-Kashmir conflict. And then on the flip side, you have other people who try to separate North and South Korea. And, you know, there's a lot of variety that comes there, but it's a lot of fun. So homeschool moms and dads watching are thinking, hmm, if I send my kid off to a, a summer camp for a week, can I count it as homeschool credit? Yes. You absolutely can. In fact, I think we have about 62 or 63 hours of education that we classify over about a week of time. You'll get your hours. That's no big deal. Now, I do recommend you make them sit down afterwards and write a paper to tell you what they learned because I think we talk about in the classes that reflection on what you went through and be able to take lessons out of it is part of how we learn. But you absolutely can, and people do it all the time. You mentioned earlier that there's a, a certain amount of ministry that goes on in the summer camps. What, what's that all about? Sure. Well, we firmly believe that you can't function well in politics or government in general without an understanding of what you believe in your moral core. For us, it comes from scripture. Um, we're Christian. And so we, we, we don't, we don't shield that at all. Um, plenty of kids come who aren't. That's no big deal. We'll welcome anyone. But when we teach, we come from that perspective. And so that includes everything from chapel or kind of uh, we do they call, what we call it wing chapel, which is a smaller group type setup. We have uh, morning devotions, individual personal Bible study. And then we have kind of classes where you see these principles. And we kind of wrestle through kind of outside of the simulation. What are these things we believe? How do they apply into how we live? Um, I do a class in the second week called, uh, well, it's ethics and foreign policy or ethics and espionage, depending on what you want to do. But it's, you, you take these ideas, these principles we believe, um, that we believe that people are made in the image of God and therefore have inherent worth and value. No matter what they've done, they are to be, they're, they're, they're valued and respected um, because they were made by him. Okay, what does that mean when you're dealing with national security and, and, and terrorists and borders and all that sort of stuff? I don't know. Well, they have to wrestle through that. And, and it's, it's that intersection of it, because I think if we have people that are just effective political operators, but don't have a strong moral core, that's dangerous for us. But then we have people who have a very robust moral core, but don't understand how the system works. And it means that those ideas aren't very effective because they don't know how to carry them well. And so we try and bridge that gap. And it's a lot of fun to see. So what other kind of civics oriented things do you do in Generation Joshua? Couple other things. Um, we have uh, kind of two day versions of the summer camps that are that are a little narrower. They they deal with a specific slice of government that we'll travel around the country and do. So if you have a homeschool co op or you have um, some sort of uh, cooperative extension or kind of a community group that you want to come in and have us do a day or a two day program that looks at one part of this, we're glad to do that. It's a lot of fun. Um, it's not quite as robust as what we do for camp, but it's a little shorter and we can come to you with it. Uh, the other thing we do. 
and we call those intensives. Um, and and there are, there's also a few topics in there that we that are not part of camp. We do the judicial system. We do uh, we even do the a comparative government class where we look at the Westminster system of politics for Britain and Canada. It's a lot of fun, a little little elaborate, but a lot of fun. But then. We also do something called student action teams, and those are our uh, kind of a chance for students to take what they've learned about principles and politics and apply them in a in 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 real world setting, not just in a simulation anymore. Because at a certain point, you have to make that jump from learning in theory to to learning and function. And so those usually happen in the fall. All the special elections do come up every once in a while. And so what we'll do there is we partner with uh, the HSLDA PAC. Um, there's a state one and there's a federal one, depending. And we will take teams of students. We'll pair them with pro, pro-family, pro pro-homeschool candidates that go through a vetting process and whatnot. And we will let them deploy and kind of help kind of make that happen uh, with, with nominal or no cost to the person involved to work on behalf of a candidate that fits our qualifications. But the purpose of it is really twofold. I think sometimes people look at that and say, oh, it's a political army. Uh, there's definitely political impact, don't get me wrong. It, can, it is one of the most effective political ground games that I'm aware of that's run by a volunteer corps anywhere in the US. But I think the bigger impact, and, and the, really the reason we do it, is not just because we get to elect good people, and sometimes we do. Um, but we we pick the races that are really close in the country where uh, it's going to be down to the wire, not the ones where they're gerrymandered to, to one end or the other. And we take students there and we, we let them get engaged because we want them to learn two things. Well, first of all, we want them to learn the techniques of advocacy. We want them to learn some self-confidence, the ability to speak. You walk up to a door and talk to someone you've never, you've never met before. How do you do that? Well, honestly, a lot of students... In America today, a lot of people are frankly downright uncomfortable having a conversation with someone they've never met. I don't find it terribly comfortable still, and I've been doing it for years. But you need to learn that. And so it's a practical way to learn that kind of basic advocacy because at a certain point, as we grow up, we're going to find ourselves in a place we have to go up and advocate for ourselves, for our family, for our children, and you need the confidence to be able to do that. You also need to learn the basic grassroots techniques necessary for political engagement in our country because wherever these students go home, It's a chance for them to take those principles and the techniques they just learned and apply it at their town, at their county, at their school board, at, I guess, their dog catcher race, whatever that happens to be. It lets them become engaged, equipped citizens um, that I think our country needs more of, Um, actually, and particularly ones that are well-engaged and well-equipped. And so the idea is that they walk out as a better citizen, understanding not only like how to do it, but kind of why it works. It means we're spending time in the morning and evening explaining the the ideas and the and the principles and the mechanics and the even some of the social theory, like how people think and operate and ideas and motivations, so that you understand how this system works. Because I think sometimes people get really frustrated with our political system, for sometimes for good reasons, and I think sometimes also for some reasons that are basically just a lack of understanding. Um, we don't understand why they do what they do. And therefore, we're annoyed by it. And sometimes when you understand why they do what they do, you're like, okay, this is this is annoying to me, but I get what they're doing and why. And that knowledge and that insight brings wisdom. I think the the showcase of that was a couple of years ago. We had a a mom called to call our office and she was laughing and it was after the election. And, and, and she had a daughter who had been on one of our student action teams and been actually at one of our camps. And after the election, there was something happening in, in Congress and um, her uh, husband had been watching something happening on the house floor and someone made a motion and someone did this, whatever. And he kind of got all bent out of shape and was grumbling and kind of ranting at it. And his daughter, who was behind the couch reading, popped up behind the couch and goes, no, no, dad, it's no big deal. What they did was, and, and she sat there and in about 20 seconds explained what had just happened and then predicted what was about to happen on the house floor of the U.S. Congress. And she's like, it's no big deal. This is a, man, a, a procedural minutia thing and it gonna, it's going to end up like that. And then it did. <laughs> And her, the the mom was like, my husband was flabbergasted. And she went back, the, the girl had gone back to her book because she, was, she wasn't interested in politics, but she understood what it meant to be a citizen and how our government worked. And he's like, where did you learn? Well, I did that at camp. I actually made the same maneuver a couple months ago. And then we talked about it with Congressman so-and-so when I was on that campaign. It's, it's normal. Oh, she's never going to, she doesn't want to be an elected official. She doesn't want to go into politics, but she knows enough and she knows more than most, to be an informed citizen. And that's better for our country as a whole. And we build that every year. And it's a lot of fun. 
So speaking of fun, what's the most satisfying thing for you in uh, the work you get to do with the Generation Joshua Student Action Kids? Wow. Um, I think the most satisfying thing, particularly with the student action teams, is when you see a student do some quick math and realize that if they hadn't be been there or they and their friend hadn't been there, the outcome of that race wouldn't have happened the way it did. We had a race a couple of years ago, actually here in Virginia, where the race was decided by 86 votes. And each kid had talked to about a thousand people. And so when that team realized that, they sat down and did the math and they realized that if any one of them or their friends hadn't shown up, that race wouldn't have gone that way. But that race was special because that race was the tie-breaking race to control one chamber of uh, the legislature. That made a huge difference on legislation that went through that chamber for the next two, four, I think almost six years before that changed. Any one of those kids showing up, it would have been a different story. And we've had that story happen multiple times in different places. Uh, we had a, a U.S. congressional election out in California we were involved in. And that race was decided by about 4,000 votes. Uh, no, um, no, it wasn't even that much. It was less than that. It was a much smaller number. It was about 400 votes. I'm sorry. But we had uh, that team. Had, that It was a team of 50 kids. They talked to thousands and thousands of people. It matters. And they get to see that they as an individual or as a small group can have a huge impact on the future of their country if they wish to engage. You can go home and complain and not and not be engaged or you can go do something about it. And believe it or not, you often get a chance to say, hey, I did something about it and that mattered. And I'm able to see that person in Congress today or that person not in Congress today or whatever that happens to be because of what I did. That gives you ownership and frankly, it gives you empowerment. And it's really spectacular to see. Yeah, I've always been a real fan of this uh, real life practicum that we're able to do. And as you said, you know, I've never seen it as our goals, especially to elect our preferred candidates, although that's part of it, because we do want pro homeschooling families in, in office. But to see the, the way it inspires the kids and just encourages them to know that what they do actually matters. It's been really neat to see. We've seen kids get involved in those races. I've seen some of them that decide to go get involved in politics and other people who are like, no, no. That's not for me. I'm going to go be a dentist or an architect or a veterinarian or whatever it happens to be. But I'm going to be an engaged citizen wherever I live. And what I find really interesting is those students tend to become leaders in their community, whether they're engaged in politics or not. They become people who understand and have taken the effort to understand their country. And then other people go to them and say, hey, what should I do here? And they lead because they bothered to learn. And then they get trusted for it. And it's really powerful. Now, you mentioned that some do get uh, kind of inspired to go into politics. They tell, do. Us, tell us about some of those stories. I think we might have some uh, of your Gen J graduates and SAT kids that are actually in office. We do. We do. We have a couple that are actually elected and serving at the state level. One um, that I know of in particular um, from the very beginning of Gen J serves out in Indiana. Um, for a long time, he held the record as the youngest um, elected representative um, in the Indiana House. And we have another one who just got, uh, is actually in the middle of, I think, running his race for re-election or his race for election. I think he was appointed out in Washington state. Um, again, both students that had come through Gen J and said, hey, I want to do this. We have dozens, if not hundreds more that exist within um, the kind of the DC kind of arc where you see them acting as Capitol Hill staffers, legislative directors, chiefs of staff, policy wonks, people that are kind of engaging those ideas at the level. I was I was at the White House a couple of years ago and I was walking down the hallway in the old executive office building and I ran into one of my students and then I ran into another one of my students and the first one worked on the National Security Council and the other one was working in communications. And I'm like, Oh, hi. And, it's like, and then the next person that I was there to meet, who also worked originally for the vice president and then was working for the president in their communications office and was there to give us a tour. Um, and we got to go see where it happened. And we got to take, it, it was a really remarkable thing. And so we've gotten to see students who, if they really love this and they think this is what they're calling or their, their, kind of their existence drives them toward, we'll help them get there. And it's been pretty, some of them routinely are uh, speakers on TV, they're commentators, they travel the world reporting on it, investigating some of these issues. Uh, they're giving testimony at congressional hearings. Uh, sometimes they're arranging the congressional hearing. And for an organization that's only really been around for not even 20 years yet, um, seeing these students blossom and engage in that level is pretty spectacular. Well, let's switch gears. <clears throat> you mentioned earlier that you were homeschooled growing up. I was. What was that like for you? Well... Uh, it was a bit of a shock initially um, because I didn't know what I was getting into and I had to talk my mom into it. My mom didn't 
actually want to homeschool me. I wanted her to homeschool me, which was a little different because at sixth grade, I was bored with school, which bored kids do dumb stuff. So let's let's leave that for those stories for later. But no, no, no. What what dumb? <laughs> tell one dumb thing. Tell well, us one dumb thing. That- okay, at a certain point, I was reading the dictionary. <laughs> I mean, this is the nerd I was, right? And I think I got into N, and I'm like, this is pointless. See, jo- Why, Joel? This was an invitation for you to tell us something really. You know, interesting and stupid. Not or that embarrassing. You, not that you read the dictionary. <laughs> oh no, no, that's pretty. That that I mean, that, that is actually fairly embarrassing. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> no, I, I'd got at that point. I'd started. I'd started getting into arguments with my teachers and and other stuff. And it just maybe not the most healthy approach to things. But honestly, I I, I w- I'm a pretty quick reader, and the I have some serious other weaknesses, but I'm a pretty quick reader, and. What it meant in the in the classroom I was in was that I only moved at the rate of the kind of the the lowest common denominator in the class, and for me that was a real challenge, and it was frustrating. And what that means is you st- I started disengaging a bit, and so I said, "Hey, mom, why don't you homeschool me?" She's like, "I have no idea what I'm doing, and it would be a disaster, and it would be really bad." And we kind of argued back and forth about it, and eventually I made her a deal, and I said, "Mom, I will homeschool myself if I have to. Please get me out." This is just going to be bad for everyone. Um, And she said, okay. And we tried it for a year. And then we kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it. And it provided me some opportunities, unlike stuff that I would have ever had any other way. And my brothers were homeschooled, each of them with a slightly different twist on what it looked like. The flavor was different. Um, I ended up doing like kind of the the early college running start program as part of that. Um, But I, unlike most homeschool students, I started in junior high and went through high school rather than doing elementary on. My brothers were the reverse. They started in elementary into high school until they got to some really um, precise class stuff they needed or some technical things. So, uh, and so we all homeschooled in one form or another for most of our of our high school career. Um, and my mom had worked uh, led our homeschool co-op at a certain point and has been involved in the homeschool program and homeschool community in Eastern Washington State now for a very long time. So. so she she not only uh, allowed you to be homeschooling, she became a homeschool leader. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> Funny thing that, and then kept being a homeschool leader for probably a decade after we were done, just because she'd done it and people had questions, and so she's like, "Here's what I've learned. Here's what I've done. Here's what worked. Here's what didn't work." And it's been really cool to see all of the families, not just ours, but that have kind of benefited from some of that experience um and now we're homeschooling our own kids wow tell us about that your wife's name is christy christy yep and your boys names i have david jonathan and benjamin and they go from 13 down to uh 12 down to seven down to seven yep so um david's the oldest david's the oldest and has david been to gen j camp yet he's not quite old enough yet oh come on i know somebody 14 for we, camp. I know somebody who has the power to waive ages. Yeah, I know, but I also have an insurance rule, apparently. I've been <laughs> oh, informed no. that I can't get below I can't get below 13. Uh, so next year, maybe, since dad will be coming with him, but uh, not quite there yet, but soon. He's done a few things with us already, but he's not quite old enough for camp on his own. Besides, if he's like me, he's going to be like, I know someone, and therefore I don't have to follow these rules. <laughs> and that would not be good. <laughs> so, so what's your what's your uh, your homeschool like in your, in your now pretty well-established homeschool. Yeah, we've been doing this for a while now. Um, we are in, involved. In, actually, we, my wife initially started a co-op. Now we're involved in a co-op. And and then they discovered that she's done a bit of this. So now she's on leadership and is realizing that that takes a lot of work, like my mom discovered when she was doing it. Um, homeschooling for us, in, in one sense, the idea is to build a pattern of education um, where it doesn't consume your life. But it's something that can be consistently done by the kids every day with some variety day to day. So it's not the same thing every single time. I think one of the things that will kill a soul is when there's never any any changes in what you're doing. And so there's a fair bit of variety programmed into it. A lot of a lot of field trips, right? That homeschoolers thrive on field trips. We go here, we go there. I think every trip my wife has taken with the boys now includes a stop at some museum or something somewhere. And the boys have seen all sorts of stuff that I never got to see as a kid when I was growing up until I started being homeschooled. Um, so that proved very consistent, the ability to just go and see and do. So that's been really cool. Uh, it also means that we've gone through it, particularly for the first couple of years, we went through a lot of curriculum because uh, believe it or not, each of my kids are remarkably different mm-hmm. and they learn very differently. 
Um, we went through about, I don't remember, it was like eight different math curriculums from my oldest. At a, a couple of years in, we just said, this isn't working well. And so we went through about eight different curriculums in about two months. And then we found it and it worked and he's doing really well and you're seeing that excellence. But we were just, but it was frustrating. We said, we don't, we had this moment where we're like, we don't have to stick with the, the one thing that everyone does. We can do something else. And then we did that. And so that worked really well. And then we did the same thing later with uh, a, my middle child who was wrestling with a particular aspect of reading. Um, same with my oldest. And what we discovered, ironically, the best thing for reading, and this is kind of hilariously awkward, but for my middle child, the best thing for him to read was to be introduced to the comic Calvin and Hobbes mm -hmm. because he thought it was hilarious. And he is developing a college level vocabulary as a nine-year-old. And this is terrifying, but he's giggling and he's learning. Okay. And now the seven-year-old wants him to read it. So now he's reading the comics to the seven-year-old, which also doesn't help either, but, but at least gives him ideas that they're probably not very healthy, but they learn. And that flexibility has been incredible. Now, of course, they have their, their traditional curriculums and materials that are involved in that, but they <laughs> that freedom to say, okay, we're going to stop this, disengage, come back around at it from a different way. It's like, okay, so, so math is not going well. Let's switch over and do this topic and we'll come back to that. And we can. And that works better. Sometimes it means like, you know what? This this week we're going to be outside to start with and we're going to do the the inside stuff later and we can flip our day depending on the temperature, the weather, the humidity. Um, they can take it with them in different spots. This, there's been a lot of a lot of the variety and diversity that homeschooling thrives on has become kind of a hallmark of what we do. And that's been really help, helpful. So there are a lot of people today who maybe didn't think they'd ever homeschool. Um, and then after the school closures and the pandemic and all that have... Uh, taken up homeschooling and they may, they may not come from, you know, a, a lifelong homeschooling background. And no. what do you have to say to those folks? I mean, it sounds like, uh, maybe it's not quite as formally challenging in some ways as a lot of people think. No, it, it doesn't have to be because at the end of the day, the question is, is your student learning? If the answer is yes, then we're doing well. If the student's not learning, then we sit down and kind of reconsider it and come up with a new plan. And I think sometimes we get so locked into the plan we have at the beginning of the year that we make it harder for ourselves than it needs to be. The other thing I think that's really neat to see is that there is a stunning level of diversity and variety within the homeschool community as far as how it can be done. Um, and that means that often it's like, well, this didn't work. Okay, shrug. Let's find something else. That's that's not a failure. It just means that that option didn't work. In a sense, it's kind of Einstein with the light bulb, right? It's like, well, 498 filaments didn't work. Let's try the next one. And then you find that one and all, suddenly it illuminates. I, I think what really brought that home for me was about two years ago, we my wife and I was really, were really wrestling with one of our kids and one of their the, the skills they were trying to learn. And they just, nothing we'd tried had worked. And at that point, we'd gone through a lot of curriculum on one of those. And we're like, I don't know what it is. So we just said, okay, we're just going to keep working on it, be patient. And then we discovered over the course of about, I think it was about six weeks, where all of a sudden it clicked. And we didn't change what we were doing. But at that point, he was ready to master the thing we were trying to teach him. And honestly, in retrospect, we were early. He wasn't ready for it yet. And then he was. And then he got it. It was quick and he was off to the races. And now he uses that skill like he doesn't even think about it anymore. But but for a year and a half, it was trauma. And then it was not at all. He doesn't even, he does, we talked about this actually yesterday at dinner. He doesn't remember that it was hard. Okay. That was remarkably reassuring. Um, we, we, I think the other thing that's hard is when you're the oldest child and a family and you get the family reunion together and all the kids are there and yours are the oldest. And so everyone's trying to see how well your kids are doing, et cetera. And even from a homeschool family, there's still an element of, are they doing okay? Like, cause we don't live near where grandma and grandpa do. So they're always trying to make sure everything's good. And because you know, they love the kids. Right. And you know, the first couple of years it's rocky because every kid learns a little different at different speeds and different abilities at different levels. And then like two or three years ago, I remember talking to my mom and she's like, wow, like they've really, they've really blossomed. Yep. What'd you do? Same thing we've been doing. We listen to him. We read to him. We spend a lot of time together. We we do do a lot of reading in our household. Um, I love to read. I loved stories growing up. So it is pretty common that each night we're sitting down to read a chapter of some book or another. 
um, or a couple books and there's audiobooks in the car and there's books they're listening to and CDs and a lot of stories and adventures. And one of the things we found is that at least with our boys, we introduce them to stories and we give them the beginning of the story. And then they want to know the answer faster than I'm willing to read it. Well, if you want to know the answer faster, here's the book. You can read it yourself. And then there's the question, do I really want to read? Do I want to know the answer? I want to know the answer. And I come home and I knew it had sold that when I came home and my, my at that point, 11 year old was on the couch, feet in the air with a book and not having been told to do it. And I asked my, I said, why is David? Like he did, he was at that stage where he didn't want to read. I'm like, is he in trouble? And she's like, nope. And she's being really quiet in the kitchen. I'm like, what? And she goes, he pulled that out on his own. He doesn't know I've noticed and I'm not saying anything. So help me with dinner. Done. We'll help with dinner. And he read for like two and a half hours. And then reading was cool. It was like, it wasn't something he always went to, but it was definitely not something that scared him anymore. I'm sorry. It was a long-winded question, answer to a question. I guess what I'd tell any new homeschooler coming in is, we're really glad you're here. Welcome. There's a lot of variety. Don't be scared by it. Find the stuff that works for you. You mentioned earlier co-ops that uh, your mom's leading and your wife has led and different things. What are those and why should new homeschoolers care? Oh, okay. So cooperatives or kind of uh, homeschool co-ops is usually a team of moms um, working together, usually moms, some dads. I, I actually teach at ours sometimes, so that's definitely a thing, where they will partner on specific subjects or classes or skills, or whatever it is, where their students can learn together. And in a sense, it sounds like we just told you what a school is. That's not quite the same. Um, for us, it usually means that the parents are cooperating and taking their personal expertise and bringing it to bear for the individual kid. For, for myself growing up, my mom's expertise was literature and writing and history. And her best friend, it was science and math. Well, that worked really well because I could ask my mom science and math questions and she would look at me blankly, but I could ask her best friend, Mary, and Mary had all the answers. Um, but Mary was not going to be the person you wanted to do go to for some of the lit and history and stuff. And so they split the, the responsibilities and each person, they got, they got experts in field. Co-ops are that a little bigger. And so they'll usually meet once a week, twice a week, once a month. There's different ones and different varieties. Um, and it's a chance to engage on specific projects. So um, I helped teach one of the history classes at our co-op a couple of years ago. And we they were, wor they were working their way through um, ancient uh, ancient history. So they were in the Middle East and uh, they'd worked their way at that point over to Rome. And I think at that point they had the the Roman kind of tortoise formation. They were looking at kind of how Rome's empire expanded. So all those big shields and they have them in front and on the sides and on top and the long spears. And so for class that day, we built one. And so all the kids had these massive shields that were easily as big as the eight-year-olds that were carrying them. And then these long poles with, you know, cardboard points on them and they'd painted them and they'd done colors and design. And we had those like the metal tape. And once we taught them the Latin commands for forward, back, forward, et cetera, the class decided we were going to go out into the uh, the lobby area and practice. Now, we didn't tell the rest of the classes that were meeting about this. All of a sudden, they just heard this shout. And then marching past them in window was about, about 20 or 30 eight-year-olds with massive shields and spears in formation. And then we marched something. And then, then I had a little stick that we'd you know, poke at them if they got out of formation. They learned real quick that those shields had to be you know, locked together and overlapped. And they got really good in about five minutes. And everyone else came out to see because that was really cool. And, and so it's this chance to kind of, because some stuff works well in a group, right? Okay. And so we bring those groups together and we learn in the places where those groups fit well. Some stuff doesn't work well in groups and that works well at home. And we do that there, but it's a great chance to kind of, to, to build on each other's skills, to borrow from each other's parents' excellence, and also practically for the parents to say, Hey, this isn't working with my kid. Anyone else dealt with that? Do you have any ideas, any resources, suggestions, what worked for you? And to be able to share experience and wisdom that way. And frankly, to get some encouragement. Also is a great place to find babysitters, to swap who's watching the kids. So you can have time out. It, it's the support network you need, but also some, some technical expertise, expertise and wisdom. And if you're brand new, you get to come in and see people that are already doing it and go, okay, I can do this. There's people that have survived and they still look normal and, and their kids still, uh, their kids are working well together and they're not crazy and okay, we're good. And it, it, it gives you a kind of a, a network, um, a net to help get some stability as you start out. Well, Joel, this has been really interesting and, and important. Uh, anything you'd like to end with for new homeschooling parents out there, especially, um, and, and even maybe some of the veterans, but 
any words of encouragement or knowledge, wisdom? I think from my experience thus far, I would provide maybe two thoughts. First, in your pursuit of excellence in homeschooling, which is absolutely something we should do. The reason we do this is because we love our kids and we want to give them what's best for them, what they're able to do, what we're able to do. And, and hopefully that's, we believe that's better there than any other way. Don't push that to the expense of the relationship with your kid. Okay. Um, because when the relationship between mom and dad and child is out of balance, the education isn't going to matter. Okay. Um, that, so keep the priorities in order. Um, you love your kids. You're a family. That that goes above the education piece of it. The education piece is really important. So don't dis don't disregard it, but understand it goes in in orders. So if you need to stop for a day and say we're gonna figure out this relational thing right now because we can do spelling tomorrow, that's almost always a worthwhile trade. Okay. So don't feel bad about that. That's really important. So. I'd say that piece first. And then second of all, I would remind parents that the sheer freedom and the diversity that exists within homeschooling allows people to try all sorts of things. And I think sometimes we put ourselves in boxes we don't need to be in as homeschool parents where it's got to be this way. No, it doesn't. There's a million different permutations and combinations. And if this one's not working, don't feel bad about pivoting to something else. Find the one that works. Then you'll have this breath, kind of the sigh of relief. And you're like, ah, oh, found it. Great. Once they found how they learn well, a kid can blow through the timeline that a hard curriculum is hitting them with. And they'll move at three, four, five, ten 10 times the speed they would otherwise. I found those moments. And you'll see it. They're like, it clicks. And then they just accelerate down the path. And you're like, how are they learning it that fast? Well, we found that sweet spot where we're teaching them in a way they understand, in a way that we can teach them. It's worth the time to find that spot. And it makes it, it'll also help your family dynamics too, because suddenly learning is a joy, not a chore. And that's a great thing. Okay. I'm going to ask you to tell me the honest truth here. So who's in charge of your family's homeschool? In all practice, my wife. <laughs> She's very good at what she does. Um, we sit down and work on the curriculum together um, at the beginning of the year. I will help with specific classes on it. And when I come home, if something's not working, I, I kind of, uh, I do clean up. Okay. So it's like, okay, I'm going to work on this lesson with you or whatever that happened, that, that sort of thing happens to be. And then I will come in and teach specific pieces. Um, but she, she is particularly gifted at teaching, even when she thinks she's not. And that's probably a lesson there as well for the dads that are listening to this. Mm -hmm. Do not forget to encourage and thank your wife. Some days it's really hard. That's true in every part of life. We have our hard days at the office. We come home, we're tired. So does she. Ask her how her day was just as often as you want to tell her about yours. Um, because you're a team in this one. She can't do it without you and you can't do it without her. Like, make sure that goes together. Um, that, that'll really matter there. So if people want to find out more about the work you're doing, where, where can they go on the interwebs? Well, if you're a kid, generationjoshua.org will tell you all about what we're doing for, for teens and young adults. If you are an adult that wants to help defend and advance our freedom to homeschool, hsldaaction.org. Um, those are the two places, and you can see all of the stuff we're doing there. Great. And if you want to find out more about uh, what HSLDA proper does, you can go to our website at hslda.org. If you're not a member, you can join there. Um, if you'd like to make a donation to help us advance homeschool freedom, you can do that there as well. My guest today has been Joel Gruy, the executive director of HSLDA Action and Generation Joshua. Joel, it's been a real pleasure. Um, thanks thanks uh, for spending your time with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you all out there. Uh, I'm Jim Mason, president of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, where we work to make homeschooling possible for moms and dads just like you. Today's episode is made possible by HSLDA's Generation Joshua program. Do you have a student who wants to make a difference in our nation? Generation Joshua empowers teens to make the most of their citizenship through local clubs, immersive simulations, online courses, and real-life campaign experiences. 
For more information, visit generationjoshua.org. That's generationjoshua.org. Thanks for listening to this episode of Homeschool Talks. If you've enjoyed this conversation, will you do us a favor by sharing it with a friend or leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts? As a reminder, you can find show notes for this episode along with our other Homeschool Talks conversations at hslda.org forward slash podcast. And if you want to be the first to know about new episodes, as well as upcoming guests and topics, you can sign up for our email list using the link in the show notes. That's all for now. We hope you enjoyed this program and we'll see you next time.